Welcome to Virtual Book Signing. I'm Daniel Weinberg, and as usual, we're here at the Abraham Lincoln Bookshop in Chicago. We have a nice crowd in here as well, and we ha we're happy that you're going to give some of your Saturday to us. We have a couple of interesting books and even more interesting authors, actually. Uh, <clears throat> remember that we're live right now, and if you'd like to email in a question while we are, please feel free to do so, and we encourage it. And for that matter, sign your name and tell us where you're from so we can at least shout out to you and and thank you for uh, participating in here. This is an interactive event here. Uh, so if you're watching on the archive, we'll probably have some of these still there, uh, first editions and signed while they last. So if you have an interest in one and you're, you're looking at the archive, give us a call, email us, and hopefully we'll have one of these for you. We're going to bifurcate this show today and have one author at a time. Uh, and so I'm going to just say that Dave Powell with his Chickamauga campaign will be coming up shortly uh, in another half hour. So stay tuned for that, please. Meanwhile, sorry about the noise for our microphone. Uh, we now have Catherine Canavan, uh, an independent researcher. Among the places for where she's written was USA Today, Philadelphia Inquirer, Florida Times Union, AARP Bulletin, I'm a reader, and uh, Prevention Magazine and others. Uh, this is her book now. It took her five years, she just told me, to do. Lincoln's Final Hours, Conspiracy, Terror, and the Assassination of America's Greatest President. A University Press of Kentucky publication, 233 pages, intensely illustrated, and is $29.95. Well, you know, there's no surprise that, you know, and to me, that you have some heavyweights on the back here, uh, Lincoln heavyweights endorsing this book. Frank Williams, Joan Chaconis, Ed Steers, uh, and they all, all say that this has been a crowded field, the assassination field. So my question is, why did you decide to enter this field all of a sudden? What, what sparked you? Well, Daniel, I, I'm a reporter, and I was on assignment in Washington, D.C., and I, uh, in between assignments, I had a little downtime, and I visited the Peterson House. Yeah. Peterson House, the house where, as all your readers know, the house where President Lincoln died, the house across the street from Ford's Theater, uh, is a very special place. That day, I followed tourists speaking several languages into the house and they were chatting up a storm until they got to the back, that small back bedroom uh, known as the death room. Then invariably they fell very silent and reverent because there's something about that room where the president died. There was a wonderful docent there that day and I asked her if there was a good book about the Petersons and their, I didn't know then, their fascinating borders. And she said, no, in 150 years, no one had ever written a book about the, the boarding house. And I thought, well, that can't be right. So I went to my assignment, and after, after I left, I almost ran to the Library of Congress, where I checked all the databases, even checked the rare book room. And I realized the docent was right. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, this is a story I'd like to tell. No, what I, one of the things I like about this one, uh, because these days you see books with all the photographs right in the middle, and this has photographs all the way through it, which I like, right where they should be also. Uh, so it's heavily illustrated. Uh, who made that decision to put them, uh, intersperse them instead of putting them in the middle? University Press of Kentucky let me put them wherever I wanted. Oh, they, nice. were, they were wonderful. They were a good press. Uh, you have another very pleasant surprise uh, endorsement on here, I thought, from Eric Larson, the Devil in the White City yes. uh, author. And he writes that you write of, and I'm going to quote, the single most petty act by any one individual in the history of America, but I'll save that for the book. Why was it so petty? Um, William Peterson, the proprietor of, the, of Peterson's boarding house, uh, even before the president was buried, sent the federal government a bill for every napkin, every uh, pillowcase, every sheet that the president 
uh, used for the president, uh, covered with his blood. He also sent them a bill for his servant's time and for his own time, mm -hmm. even though he skipped out at midnight. Yeah, he so he, he was not there until Although seven. Although he, at, at, at first instance, he did refuse to give a bill when someone came over to ask him about that, yes? He said he did, yes. He said he but, did. But there's definitely a bill in the National Archives. Of course, I'll say this, there's precedent. Because uh, Paul Revere, of all people, invoiced, billed for his oats and horse and time and all of that. I've seen two of them come up at auction. Uh, so you know, for the five rides, he billed every one of those. So I guess there's precedent for that somewhere along the line. Uh, how did you approach this book? Uh, do you see it as narrative history? Um, and where on the continuum would you put it from uh, Bill O'Reilly killing Lincoln to Ed Steer's Blood on the Moon? Where would you put yours in there? Well, uh, certainly Ed Steer's book is, is seminal and wonderful and not there. Um, I, I would hope somewhere uh, lower than Dr. Steer's and higher than Bill O'Reilly. It's positive than uh, that, I'll tell you that. Positive. <laughs> thank you. Uh, and, and it really reads very well, like narrative history. It uh, just flows and continues to go along. Um, I wanted to ask about the Booth family, so let's start with, with the man himself. And I'm going to show this just to get into that. This is a military commission uh, signed by uh, Lincoln for a guy named John Hammond, who was a surgeon. And John Hammond was actually from South Carolina. And he had come up prior, way prior from the war uh, to Philadelphia to become a uh, surgeon there. Uh, he was really uh, actually with uh, an obstetrics of all things. Uh, but when the war came, he stayed with the Union, the South Carolinian. His brother, on the other hand, stayed South, and he was such a secessionist that he, he coined the term, cotton is king. So when I see John Hammond, I think of the Brothers' War. There it was really, from him to his brother, that's the Brothers' War. How about the Booths? They were a bit um, also divided, were they not? Yeah, the Booths generally were Yankees. And uh, Edwin Booth, who voted for President Lincoln, uh, really was very angry at John Wilkes Booth. But until, until he died, he had a picture of his brother on the wall next to his bed. So they were a very close-knit family. But John Wilkes Booth was... Was he the lone sympathizer? Yeah, very much. And how did the rest of the family feel about that? Besides... You know, besides Everyone else was feeling the same thing. but uh, Well, somewhat embarrassed and somewhat angry, depending on which booth you're speaking of. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that was true, too, with the Lincolns. You know, Mary Lincoln's family uh, certainly fought for the South and, and died mm -hmm. for the South. And died for the South. Um, you know, when you start to talk about the great illumination that occurred, and um, uh, that's, what, that's what it was that week prior to the assassination. And uh, what, was Link, what was Washington like on the verge of this in brief? And that great illumination that changed things overnight in uh, James Swanson in my book, uh, we show real quickly, I'll show this. Here are two uh, banners, one and from Thursday to Saturday, that's what it was. They kept the exact same imagery and just changed the verbiage. Uh, from mm -hmm. the great illumination to the great calamity. That's a great illustration. And that, that happened uh, at Grover's Theater. It happened all over town. There were, there were changes such as that. But uh, one of the things I think is telling is that on the morning of April 14th, there was no bad news on the front page of the main Washington newspaper. And on the morning of April 15th, there was nothing but bad news. Mm -hmm. It was that fast. The illumination was the wildest, most wonderful week in Washington history. Even to this day, there's never been anything like it. They had three-story high, fiery letters spelling out Grant and uh, Sherman and Union on the uh, city hall, made of limelight. Uh, the the uh, Capitol Dome was lit with... I think it was 425 gas jets. 
how every house was lit by candlelight or limelight or obviously gaslight. Uh, it was prior to electricity, of course. And, and it was especially uh, wonderful because all of Washington had been dark for most of the war. Um, well, then, of course, John Wilkes Booth came in. Um, who was it? Helen Truman. That was interesting that I learned that she was uh, on the stage out, uh, off in the wings, and she saw Booth. And Booth saw that she was staring at her, as you report, and did a little a bow to her to mm -hmm. acknowledge. Uh, that was kind of an interesting moment, I bet. Yeah. Did she talk about that later? Yes, yeah, she did. And uh, she talked about it in, I think, the San Francisco Chronicle years later. And you would think that would be telling. But, of course, Booth was um, the equivalent of uh, Brad Pitt today. Yeah. Yeah. So no one suspected that he was in an odd place in the theater. He had the run of the theater. And uh, Captain McGowan, who was there, in his testimony, he said that he had to scrunch back and let Booth go by. Mm -hmm. And, of course, everyone said that the, the box was not guarded. But uh, it was, in a way. Uh, the footman for uh, Lincoln was out there and mm -hmm. looked at the card that mm -hmm. Booth showed. Isn't any, I mean, anyone could, anyone of Booth's stature, no one was going to stop Booth going no. into that. So a garden would have helped, would it? No, Booth, um, I think one of the uh, saddest but most poignant things is that Booth was actually humming a tune on his way up to shoot the president. To me, that's stunning. He, he was just so well known that people allowed him access anywhere. Well, that's not, uh, it's not a surprise and probably shouldn't be. Um, I want to show uh, this right now. The wish I had the originals here. Uh, the bottom one is uh, this. This is costume clipped from Laura Keene's costume, and the one on the bottom was a clipping that she gave to the state of Illinois when she went in November of '66, 1866, and um, and gave that to the state. It was at the tomb for a while, and uh, finally it was. Uh, it was given to the state itself. Uh, the top one is one that I got uh, a little later on. I went down there, and when I lined up the costume, the blood from mine, I think I'm not doing this right, am I? Uh, went straight into, there we are. Nice if you have it the right way. Uh, went straight into theirs. I think, no, maybe I did it the other way before. Anyway, I'm going to read you really quickly what, uh, what this said here. A, a letter came with it uh, that her daughter, Laura Keene's daughter, uh, daughter, afterward married my friend, this is by a man named John Johnston, um, and, and she married a friend, artist Professor A.L. Ralston. In the summer of 1879, Johnston and his wife were visiting this, uh, uh, the two of them, the Ralstons, and they were talking about that tragic night, and she said that she had the dress stained with blood in the other room. Well, I said to her, uh, well, you, you will never wear it or sell it, but if you ever do cut it up, won't you give me a small piece of it? She spoke to her husband, and they together left the room, returning in five minutes. She gave me this fragment of that stained dress with the blood of the martyr president. Also, there's, there's uh, gray matter on here as well. So, uh, Laura Keene, and that's going to get me right into the, a question that came in from... Uh, Lyndon, Michigan, Larry DeMar. Uh, thank you, Larry, very much for the question. Is it true that Laura Keene went to the presidential box after the shooting? Uh, it, no one really knows that for sure, but certainly there's evidence that she did. Didn't uh, Leal say, and, and, didn't Leal say that? Uh, he did, but I mean, Leal said she was there, but there were so many people. It was, it was pandemonium after the shooting. There were people... Uh, uh, at first, everyone sat in stunned silence, but then uh, almost as if somebody turned a switch, people started throwing chairs and trying to jump on the stage, and one woman put her foot through a, uh, through a, a band instrument trying to get a boost up to the stage. It, it, it was just totally wild. And in fact, in the midst of all this pandemonium, John Lutz 
who was uh, Laura King's husband and manager, went into her room, into her dressing room. He he managed to stop by at the box office in the midst of all this and collect her pay for the night. She was one of the few people. Friday night was pay night at Ford's Theater, and yeah. she was one wow. of the few people who got paid that night because of uh, what happened. But. Um, he also went into her dressing room and saw her diamonds uh, uh, scattered across her dressing room and went out to berate his wife, who most likely was in the presidential box, just searched through the entire theater to find her, to, to berate her for leaving her diamonds out. Hmm. But uh, do you feel that she was up in the box? I mean, uh, many I of us do. Was, but, I think she was. Yeah, you know, I think so too. Uh, and I think this dress is uh, actual, an actual relic from that moment, yes. a blood relic. Um, here is um, Joseph Hazelton, who was an eyewitness to do this. He was one of the stagehands, am I right? Um, it was, a, it was an uh, Aaron Boy program. Was a boy. Yeah, yeah, he, he was had a the program and, and errands and that he would do when he was a kid. But he later made a cottage industry of writing this out and signing it and probably got a couple of bucks for it each time. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've seen this here and there. But was there much of a Rashomon effect that night? I mean, everyone is seeing it and it's in a, a mess. And did the eyewitnesses differ quite a bit or, or were there groups of them seeing the same thing? Um, they they differ they differ in, and and uh, if you look at the early reports which are probably the truer reports they're not that far apart mm -hmm. and uh, Hazelton's interesting because he like many of the players at Ford's uh, followed the uh, theater industry westward into the movie industry and he later appeared in a film with Lon Chaney. Yes, uh, with Lon Chaney. Yeah, yeah. And another, another one uh, appeared as Lincoln, didn't he? I yes, have a note uh, here somewhere in a silent uh, film. Billy Ferguson. Ferguson, who was, was the call boy. How how was that film? How did he do as Lincoln? Uh, uh, there's no copy that I could find. I looked. Oh, that's too bad. I like to know <laughs> what that was like. Um, well, uh, you mentioned that papers fell out of Lincoln's hat, and Mary was picking some of them up. Do we know where those papers are and what they were? Uh, we just know that she went to a, a young man who was in the military and he preserved them for her. I don't know. I'm sure someone might know, but I don't know. All right, that'd be an were. interesting thing to find out where, where those uh, are. What were the contents of his pockets? Those came out uh, not that long ago. Yes. Uh, well, <laughs> his pockets were packed. Uh, he had at least one pair of eyeglasses, possibly two. He had a watch. Um, he had uh, a Confederate five-dollar bill in his wallet. Uh, I don't know what happened. What? <laughs> well, I think it's in the Smithsonian now. Uh, he had a whole variety of uh, items in his pocket, including a pair of glasses he bought for 37 and a half cents at a jewelry store, reading glasses. Mm, mm. He went to Osco and, and got, <laughs> got something off the rack. Um, so let's get to Peterson House. Uh, first of all, I found it ironic that Booth himself, as reported, had slept in the same bed that Lincoln died in not long after. More than once. More than once. Uh, Booth's uh, childhood chum, uh, John Matthews had that room until April first, and then Matthews moved upstairs. So it wasn't it wasn't odd, and in fact, uh, Billy Ferguson reported seeing Booth when he delivers scripts there. They would practice their scripts in Matthews' room. For those who haven't been to Peterson House, very briefly, how is it laid out when you walk in? Because the room itself was part of a hallway originally. Right. 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 Um, uh, Peterson House is kind of a, if, if you're familiar with shotgun row houses, where they go straight back, well, it's a shotgun hallway that goes straight through. And this little ceiling, uh, kind of slope ceiling room, is, is made off the hallway, kind of. And then there's a parlor to the left and another in. parlor to the left. Yes. So Mrs., Mrs. Lincoln took the first parlor. Mm and uh, Stanton and the others took the second parlor that night. Uh, us, yeah, Stanton, 
Stanton sat at a table rather like this one and positioned himself so he could see everyone who passed into Lincoln's room. Mm. Well, he was running the country right then, was he not? And <laughs> not. Uh, you can right. give a great um, view, of a reporter's view, of what it was like to be in there. Pretty horrendous. Uh, <laughs> with Mary there especially, right. it was pretty yeah. a, a horrendous time. Um, tell us, uh, first of all, the, the Peterson family. Peterson himself was a tailor, he is that was. correct? And how many uh, of his family were right there in the house? Uh, that night, <coughs> there was bless you, Peterson, his servant, and two children. Um, there was Pauline, who was 13, and Fr I'm sorry, three children. Fred, who was 15, and Charles, who was 10. Charles actually had been at Ford's Theater when, when the assassination occurred. And he got back over to the house? Yes. Yeah, was, which is And different. he was able to get in. I know that Fred tried to get in, and uh, was it Ferguson who helped him into yeah, the home uh, because they wouldn't let him in the front? Right, Fred. Uh, Fred. Fred was actually in an in a very strange position. He went to see the other show at Grover's Theater, and as he's sitting there, they had red, white, and blue programs for everyone because it was the the you know the week of the illumination. It was a great celebration. Everybody was so happy, and they had a um, banner outside uh, outside Grover's that said. Uh, 1860 to 1865, the cradle to the grave. Mm -hmm. They meant the war, but it was taken later to be, of course, the president, yes. and they changed it very quickly. But uh, Fred was sitting there with his program watching when the doors broke open and a man yelled, President Lincoln has been assassinated at Ford's Theater, turn out. And this young man yelled, uh, the people were really upset, and then this one man James Tanner, who had been at the, uh, who had lost both his legs in battle, said, it's a ruse of pickpocket, sit down, and everyone did. But then, a, a, not very long after, uh, the C.D. Hess, the theater manager, came out and announced in the exact same words, and people began to file out. Just after, as soon as the house was cleared, C.D. Hess uh, telegraphed Leonard Grover, the owner of the theater in New York, and his telegraph said something to the effect of, uh, uh, President Lincoln shot tonight at Ford's Theater. Thank God it wasn't ours. Yeah, I bet. Um, <clears throat> we have a, a question from Dan Pearson in Beaver Dam. Thank you, Dan. I'm glad you're watching. Hello. Uh, Lincoln died in the Peterson house in the room rented by William Clark. Yes. Are you able to share anything new about Clark and his activities that night and the following morning? Uh, Clark was out, um, like most young people his age that week of the illumination. He was out celebrating. And he came home, and uh, after this was, he came home very late, and after um, the president's body had been removed, he climbed into bed. And slept. He wrote a letter to his sister, and he climbed into bed and slept. He very quickly, a little more quickly than the Petersons, realized uh, the gravity of the situation and uh, how important the relics in that room were. And he squirreled a couple away for himself. Well, relic hunting uh, was everywhere quickly, all through the war, everywhere. Uh, well, here we are. Here's a death scene, and uh, you can see why, as I mentioned earlier, why he died from a lack of oxygen in the room. <laughs> so, what was it like in the, in the room and in the house that night? Give us a brief overview. Well, it, well, first, just imagine that you're the Petersons, and there's, you know, imagine what your house looked like when you have young children on a Friday night, let alone the Friday night of the Grand Illumination, where people have been partying all week. And there's a knock at the door, and they carry in the dying president, and then the First Lady, almost on and off, many senators, congressmen, reporters, uh, all the doctors, uh, and several socialites who were trailing Mary Lincoln and trying to help her. And uh, also, it's 1865, so you don't have any plumbing. The, all you have, you, if you want hot water, you have to make it 
if you want, uh, obviously you have to have uh, chamber pots, several chamber pots for all these people, and you've got to empty them. So it was, it was, it was quite a situation. Everyone's crowded in there, but this wonderful piece. Um, several of the doctors were asked. But there were many, many artists in there during the nine hours. Stanton let many artists in. Yeah, yeah, many artists came in. Artists, you know, artists were special, and, and just like reporters were allowed in, along with along with the uh, mm -hmm. congressmen and senators. Um, they. Um, uh, Dr. Leal, I believe, said he posed for three artists that night. In the death room? In the death room, yes. Mm. I mean, a lot of people came over, of course, and many have called that the rubber room effect. Mm -hmm. uh, a book on that, that it just, you know, so many people in there must have had a uh, rubber room. Um, there was some, now, of course, the bed was then photographed by a resident. It's the, uh, uh, the brothers, uh, I have here, Julius and Henry. Okay, were there, right. and they're fascinating people that they, were happen to be there. Tell us about them. They they really are. Uh, well, first of all, they were volunteers that night. While while Mr. Peterson skipped out, uh, Julius and Henry spent the entire night. Uh, it, it, there are thirteen very small rounded steps from uh, the kitchen of the Peterson house to the death room. And if you run up and down them more than three times, you become very tired. They're very narrow. They did it all night long to get bottles of hot water for the, to keep the president's circulation going. They were terrific. But in the morning, after the president's body was removed, they came down, uh, and it's, it's not known exactly how they got into the room because Stanton put a guard on the uh, the main door, but there was a back door that people knew, people who lived there knew, and, and that may have been it. But they got in, and they took that iconic deathbed photo, mm -hmm. but they were so afraid that it would be taken from them that they kept it under wraps until in their family. The photograph, you mean? Yes, until 1965, mm. where one of their uh, descendants was living in England, and she sold it to Dorothy Kundart to raise money for her church. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the, uh, is this, did they, did they take that photo before or after Clark went in to take a, a snooze? I'm not, I think before because of the timing. He, he, um, they um, waited, as soon, they wanted to do it as soon as they could. They were also working with a material, and I've forgotten the name right now, but it had to set within 10 minutes mm -hmm. if you wanted your photo. Mm -hmm. So I think they zoomed in there and zoomed out as soon as the body was removed. Right, I want to ask you a question about Mary Surratt. Um, uh, now, she gave a brace of pistols <laughs> to go down to Surrattsville, the tavern, uh, she said she didn't recognize Powell when he came to the door. He had, had secreted a photo or had a secret photo in a drawer of Booth. Uh, and as, as uh, Andy Johnson said, she kept the nest within which the rotten egg was hatched. Uh, so what do you think? Should she have been hanged or no? Was, was it a, a viable thing to do that? So, I'm really, I, I've kind of focused on the Peterson house and, and not on Mrs. Surratt. But um, that was just I, uh, curious I, of your, your I thought think on she uh, obviously was not an innocent bystander. I don't know the, the depth of her involvement. Yeah. Well, she ran afoul of vicarious liability, certainly. That was a law. If you yeah. knew something was going to happen and you didn't go to someone and say something, then, well, there you are. Um, you know, two relics, and you have a lot to say about this in the book, which is fun. Two relics that remain are the Peterson House and Ford's Theater themselves. Both of them. Uh, very briefly, what happened to those two relics afterward? We know that Fords and figures are still there, but in between, there's well, a story. The Peterson house uh, was sold to a neighbor who ran a, uh, a pro-immigration newspaper from the English basement, and his family moved in, and uh, the Shads, and they had four children and they allowed their children the sunniest room in the house was the death room it has two full windows and it uh it's 
just very a very nice room. Uh, Mrs. Shaw turned it into a playroom for her children. People would still come knocking at the door because it was the house where President Lincoln died, and they would very graciously, as it was the habit of the day, allow people in. And then they would scold Mrs. Shaw for allowing her children to play in, in the Lincoln room. So they moved. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, they, uh, when they sold it, um, a fellow uh, named uh, Osborne Olroyd, yep. <laughs> yes, uh, who was, uh, someone once said, uh, was the ultimate Lincoln fan. He had been collecting since he was 19, I think. Uh, I'm not sure of the age. And he owned uh, a wheel from the Lincoln Surrey. He thought he owned Mrs. Lincoln's cook stove, but it turned out Robert Lincoln took that back. He had lived in both Lincoln houses. He'd been a renter right. in both right. Springfield and uh, uh, Peterson House. And it's Mr. Olroyd, uh, we owe a debt of gratitude because it was his collection that is now the Ford's Theater collection. Right. He had a piece of Booth's um, crutch, which he walked the Booth route um, to get, and uh, um, Frankie Mudd, Dr. Mudd's uh, wife, told him where he might get a piece of that. Um, he had uh, the Lincoln Family Bible with a nine-year-old Abraham Lincoln uh, autograph in it. Uh, he, he, he just had some marvelous, a real Lincoln log split by the president. Yes, that I'm not so sure about. Uh, Dennis, <laughs> if that came from Dennis Hanks, maybe not. But everything yeah. else, Olderoy was an amazing collector. Uh, I don't think he has to uh, uh, stand uh, above many others I know, like Dan and, uh, and many others that uh, have great collections. But he certainly saved a lot, and thank God it's in Fords. Well, this went too fast. And I still have more I like to do. Certainly, there's a lot more in the book. And it's just a fast-paced book that you're going to find yourself right in the middle of the moments that uh, occur here. And, of course, they stir all of our blood. So I think that you enjoy uh, reading this book very much. It's a, it's a great read. And uh, University Press of Kentucky, we thank them for sending you over here. And we are now going to do a quick switch. Not going to be any more than a minute, minute and a half at the most. And Dave Powell is going to come in here. And Catherine, thank you so much for being part of this. And uh, we'll talk again. Thank now you, we're going Dave. to switch over. Please remain.